Before we get into the video, I do want to say that Brenda has her own YouTube channel and it's going to be linked. All of her, the, all of the information for Brenda's channel is going to be linked in the description box down below as well as this is going to be a part one, part two series and the part two will be on Brenda's channel. Before you guys watch this video, just know she's laughing because she's like, sorry if I trigger you guys. Oops. This <laughs> is Brenda's story and I really don't like to edit parts out because this is your truth. Yeah. So if you are really sensitive to talks of suicide, talks of depression, anxiety, all of those types of, and we might even touch on self-harm. If that stuff is very hard for you to watch, this episode's not for you. There's plenty of other episodes where we don't talk on this stuff and you can go watch those. But this one is Brenda's story and I don't want to censor your story so you can say anything okay. you wanna say. So also, I did forget to say this. Those of you who don't know who Allison is or Daniel's family, Daniel is Paul Kingston, the leader's older brother, and Daniel is your dad. Your mother is his fifth wife? I think so, fifth. They don't even know. <laughs> he has so many. 14 <laughs> wives total, right? Yeah. He had one leave him, Shirley yeah. left him. 14 wives, and then um, just for people who really love the Jeets, a lot of people on my channel love connecting the dots. Her mom is Jessica and Andrea's mom's full sister, mm. and they both married Daniel as they were teenagers, right? Yeah. So Crazy. I have, I have siblings that are also my cousins. Yeah, which they're probably, they're the closest ones related to you. Jessica and Andrea, that family is closer related to you than the rest of Daniel's kids. Unless, because Daniel married his half sisters too. Yeah, there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> there's just a lot going on in her family. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Amanda Ray. And whenever I was 17, almost 18 years old, I left a polygamous cult. Today, we have my cousin Brenda, who also left the same polygamous cult as me. If you have been watching my channel, you may have seen Allison's story. She's Allison's full younger sister and an escaping polygamy star. <laughs> Do you want to uh, talk about that a little bit? <laughs> if, you, if you guys have seen, it, it was little sister. The yeah. I always joke that my face was blurred and my name was Beep, so... So you never were on it? <laughs> <laughs> so I could have been anybody, but... Are you okay with saying it was you? Yeah, oh, okay. that's fine. Yeah. I mean, it was my story at the time, so... I don't know fully what happened other than what I watched, and I'm sure the viewers only know what we saw, which was that you were trying to get out of the situation. Chanel and Vianne picked you up from Enzyme, right? Mm -hmm. What was the things that led up to that day? I was super suicidal oh, wow. and Daniel was very present in my life at that time. Mm -hmm. And so there was always that fear of like him showing up and yeah. not knowing what was going to happen next. So initially I was just gonna commit suicide. <laughs> that really was the plan? Yeah, I didn't even consider leaving. Um, I was just gonna not be alive anymore. Yeah. And then when I told one of my friends and they basically said that they would rather me leave and that's when I got the idea and I was like, oh. You're like, that's an option? Yeah, yeah exactly. I was like, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> it's crazy to think too, because when I was going through suicidal thoughts in the order, I thought I was the only one. I was like, no one else is going through what I'm going through because no one's talking about it. Everyone's yeah. pretending that they're so happy do, living their polygamy life, living their, you know, being a child bride, marrying to their cousin. And so I'm like, maybe I'm just the odd one out and I'll just remove myself. But I had, I guess I was a little bit older when I got into that. So I had, um, here's the options if I leave. Here's the options if I just go die. <laughs> yeah. and, and obviously that thought in the back of your head is like, maybe I could still go to heaven if I die in the order. But if I choose to leave, I'm giving up my salvation. Yeah. Did you have those thoughts? Um, I think it was really, really different for me because I... You were a lot younger. How old were you? I was 13 when I left. Um, but I was struggling with suicidal ideation mm -hmm. at a very, very young age. Mm -hmm. um, so it didn't really like occur to me as like, will I still go to heaven if I commit suicide? Um, until one of my friends, who was my half-sister, Rachel, mm -hmm. um, she committed suicide and Daniel said a lot of horrible things about her and even, I think, I might just be remembering wrong, but I'm pretty sure even at her funeral, someone was like, 
this is really sad because normally a funeral is a celebration of life, but we know that because she killed herself, she's going to hell. Oh my God. <laughs> and so ridiculous. then I started thinking about it in a way of like, if I kill myself, I'm going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. And you just have to be okay with that decision. Yeah. Well. I kind of just thought to myself, well, I'm already like in hell, so maybe... Maybe hell's better than this. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll like it more. Uh, suicide was such a on the forefront of your brain at such a young age. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think that, because we were just talking about how your sister had committed suicide, and she was pretty young too. Yeah. What, 13, 14? 14, yeah. Do you think that it was pretty common? For Daniel's kids and they just didn't talk about it? I don't want to like stereotype in any way but growing up it was normal for me to see my like siblings and my half siblings with self-harm yeah. on their body so we didn't specifically talk or I never really like heard people talk about like oh I'm gonna kill myself other than <laughs> Rachel yeah, because um, we were close friends, so we talked a lot about that kind of stuff. But I, I saw it around me, so to me it was just normal. You said that um, the talk of like going to hell after suicide was a topic because at Rachel's funeral, it was said at the, just someone said it, or was it? It was probably thing? said at her funeral, um, but I know for a fact that after she committed suicide, it became like kind of a, a big deal for a lot of us like sisters that were within the same kind of age group mm -hmm. and we were kind of grouped into these weird like meetings yeah where they would talk about it to try to have like suicide prevention or was yeah. it i think that was the idea was to prevent it from spreading yeah. but <laughs> A lot of what they said was pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah, I almost feel like any of those meetings probably just made people want to commit more because it's probably like, because my dad's been known to say things like, oh, you want to kill yourself? You're, that's so stupid. Why would you want to do that? Yeah. So, so if that's going to make anyone want to live more, probably not. It was, yeah, it was kind of for like the first few days after she passed away, there were like these kind of mandatory meetings that all of us girls had to go to. And then afterwards, we'd all like go do something else. Like we'd go get dinner or like we'd go like look at the lights in the city mm -hmm. just to like de-stress from everything while we complain about how stupid everything they said was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, did they have those meetings? Because I know there was a rumor of like a suicide pact going around that Rachel was in. I think that in. was big. Um, okay. I think that was a big part of as to why they were having those meetings as well. I didn't know of any suicide pact until people started talking about it. Okay. Um, that's so. what I heard, and I think it was on Escaping Polygamy, I think that's the only reason I knew, was because people were talking on Escaping Polygamy about a suicide pact that had multiple girls in the same age yeah. group. I, that's the first time I even heard about it, to be honest, was really? seeing it on Escaping Polygamy, I was like, huh. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> wow. But I did hear like, I did hear rumors of people being like, this person's gonna do it now, or this person's gonna do it next. Like, it oh. was kind of weird. Yeah. It just sucks, because it's like, all these kids are struggling, and they, the order doesn't really believe in, at least when I was there, they don't talk about depression or anxiety. They, they, they just say that's demons. Yeah, <laughs> they, ma they make you feel stupid, too, for even saying that you have any of these issues, which everybody has them, especially in the order. We're all in survival mode, so we're all struggling with PTSD, anxiety, all kinds of different issues, but they kind of act like if you don't put a name on it, then you don't have it. If you don't label it, you don't yeah, have they it. Don't believe. <laughs> they don't believe in mental illness. <laughs> yeah, it's so ridiculous. And just because you don't believe in mental illness doesn't mean you don't doesn't have it. There, yeah. <laughs> it was rampant in the order. And when I left and I started learning in psychology, I was like, oh, that's what that was. <laughs> the longer I was in the order, it's like my mental illnesses were getting worse. And then yeah. as soon as I got out and was able to work on myself and allowed to go to therapy, because therapy's for crazy people too, that's what they would say, um, I was allowed to finally get to be crazy and go heal my craziness, then mm. it all was going away. Like, it's, I don't know, it's such a weird, I feel like the way that they treat a lot of these kids with, it, like we were talking about before, how they were like making you out to be a demon. Oh yeah. Like instead of holding your hand saying, you're my daughter, let's get you help, get you what you need because you're crying out for help. 
Mm. Instead, they're like, oh, you're a demon. What's wrong with you? Yeah. How does that fix anything? I don't understand. I don't know. Yeah, did it help you <laughs> when they did <laughs> no. that? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't really think that their intentions were ever to help me, but to just get me back in control. Yeah. So. That's a good way of putting it. Because when I look back on my time in the order, a lot of the time I felt like I was just a number to them. I was one mm -hmm. of the 30 plus kids that my dad had. <laughs> and <laughs> if. the walking incubator. <laughs> yeah, that's how it felt. And it felt like um, when you were out of line and you're, or you're struggling with your emotions, you're just an issue for them now. Now you're just yeah. a problem for them. You're ruining, like I felt like my dad's reputation was in my hands sometimes. Like mm -hmm. me trying to leave the order was ruining his reputation and he didn't care that I was struggling or not. He just cared that I get in line so that his reputation was better. Did you ever feel like that? Yeah, for sure. Um, with my mom, a lot. Because I feel like Daniel's reputation was already kind of That's bad. what I was just going to say. Like, <laughs> no one really liked Daniel, even his own family. <laughs> but I do feel like my mom was kind of like, like she never really said specifically, like, you're ruining my reputation. Um, but she did treat me very differently after realizing that I was trying to leave yeah. um, and learning about certain things that I experienced. Um, she did start treating me more negatively and it, I could just kind of like see the insecurities yeah. and I would think to myself like is she getting in trouble is she getting yelled at simply because I'm misbehaving probably by Daniel too like because yeah, that's what I assumed my dad would say things like um that's your kid like that's your kid she's acting out because of you and if you wouldn't have said this this and this around her then she wouldn't be believing these things like it was always my mom's fault if I was acting out yeah. she would get the so he would get the praise for the good kids, mm -hmm. and my mom would get the credit for the bad ones, for the I demon children. Yeah, I think what really made me realize that was probably going on is for a different situation, I heard my mom crying, and she was saying that she was a terrible mother mm -hmm. because Daniel hit one of my siblings. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I was like, oh, okay, so my mom really does take everything very, very personally. Yeah. Did you have a deep connection with your mom? Uh, Probably more than Daniel. <laughs> but I mean, more than Daniel, but not really. Like, I, there were moments where it was nice being around her, but honestly, that, that didn't really happen very often. And it's, I don't, I want to say it's nothing against her, but we just didn't mesh well together. I had a question. Oh, with, along with the talking about your mom, you said that your mom, as soon as she started realizing that you were wanting to leave, then she started treating you a little bit differently. How did she know you wanted to leave? Did you actually talk to her about it? Um, well, because, so she first started treating me differently when, I'll probably go into this a little bit later, but, um, so I ran away when I was 13 in January but then the summer before that, I was essentially manipulated into being sexually assaulted by someone. Mm -hmm. And in the order? Yeah. And people found out. My mom found out, Daniel found out, got in a lot of trouble. That's when the like the difference happened. Mm -hmm. And then that fall, Rachel committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And so that was when it suddenly felt like I was the new punching bag after Rachel. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until like I actually left the day that I was on that episode with Chanel. Yeah. Um, that's the first time they knew anything about me wanting to leave, but then with foster care and the pressure to go back and still having that like family visits. Yeah. Um, did, did you That's, leaving? yeah. So you leaving with Chanel and getting on a skateboarding like that, did that trigger foster care? Yeah, it opened a case for me. Um, so I personally considered that when I left. I, January 22nd, that's the date that I say I left. Mm -hmm. um, but at least for two years after that, the state was still trying to put me back. So there were times where I lived with my mom or my siblings um, for months at a time. And tried to make things work yeah and that's where the whole like once she found out I was trying to leave it was like she would just say to me and to my siblings in front of me 
not to listen to me because I was possessed. So I was like, is yeah. You? And you're what, 14, 13? Yeah, <laughs> I was like 14, 15. And I'm all talking to my little brother. And I don't remember what we were talking about. I think he just consistently kept asking me the same question, like, why don't you want to be here? Like, why, why, you why did you order? leave? Yeah, why did you want to leave the order? And I just said, because people aren't nice to me and I want to be somewhere where I can be happy and I'm not happy here. And my mom was like, don't listen to her, she's possessed. Oh and I was like, gosh. I'm right here. Like, you're saying that in front of me? And she's just like, just don't listen to her. And I was like, damn, I okay. I, I, to me, I'm like, there has to be some weird, like, disassociation or something because my mom said something similar, like, you have the devil in your eyes. Yeah. And I was a teenager, too, so I'm like, how, how can a mother look at their own child and put them in the category of Satan? Like, where is this? Is, there must be a disconnect with these mothers in the order that can, because also my mom cut me off pretty quick when I left, and I'm mm -hmm. sure your mom did, too. Once I was turning 18, yeah. So there has to be, I, I mean, obviously, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a scientist, but I've, I've thought about this a lot, especially interviewing a bunch of people having the same stories of like all of a sudden they were dead to their family. There's got to be some disconnect that order families have to where they're able to just do that to their own blood or to be able to put you in a category as soon as you're doing anything that's ungodly. And it makes me wonder if it's either like sociopathic because that's not normal to do that to your own daughter. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it could be that they're all in survival mode their whole life so they can only love you to the extent that someone in survival mode knows how. Yeah. Because when I left, I realized, oh my gosh, this was not unconditional love. This was oh, a very, sure yeah, condition-based, <laughs> sure do what I want and then I'll love you or don't do it and I will pretend you never existed. And it messes with your head as a child. I'm telling you right now, <laughs> it really messes with you. But... um. That's why, like, hearing your stories, even Allison's stories of your mom, I'm like, yeah, it triggers my memories of my mom and how it's like you, you have this weird bond with them where you love them because they're your mother, but then to see them being able to say those things about you when you're a child, mm. there's something that's just not, it almost feels like something hasn't fully developed in their brain to love you to the extent that, that a mother and daughter should. Not saying that she's deficient in her brain, but basically, like, the order doesn't allow you to have that kind of love. Yeah. I I don't think I would ever say that I actually, like, had a good relationship with my mom. Mm -hmm. um, I never... I don't think I've ever believed... Like, in the order? Or in... In loving my mom. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't think I ever did love my mom. Uh... I think part of me was like, I wanted to, yeah. and I desperately wanted to have that relationship, but it just never... It was reciprocated, yeah. Yeah, I just was never... I never felt loved mm -hmm. by her. And when I did feel loved by her, I always, in my head, felt like it was just because I was being obedient at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, what you're describing is very similar with my dad. It was like, whenever he was being nice to me and I felt like he was showing love, something in the back of my mind was like, what's he doing this for? Or is, yeah. is, there, is it because I did something? What, what's happening here? This feels abnormal, like suspicious that you're being nice to me. <laughs> yeah, the word love was kind of, it still is kind of one of those things that I don't really understand a whole bunch. Yeah. Um, because the first examples of love were so conditional. Yeah, I mean, growing up, they'd beat the crap out of you and be like, we're doing this because we love you. Yes. Yeah. How many and times? so in my head, I'm like, the word love was just an excuse to treat me however they wanted. This is something that bothers me so bad. I'm getting triggered with this one because <laughs> when you leave the order, and so let's use me for example. I leave the order, um, I, I jump right into kind of a toxic relationship. Well, I'm also toxic because I'm from the order. Yeah. So I'm, I'm having my example of love being relived in this marriage and then I get divorced and then they say all these things like, oh, ha ha, Amanda got divorced, look at her life, da 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 da. She can't even keep a relationship. All the mean things that they say about us, whatever they're gonna say, they're gonna say. But when mm -hmm. I thought about that, I was like, you guys are the reason why I struggled with relationships because you guys showed me what toxic relationships were and called it love. Like, I'm beating mm -hmm. you because I love you. Then then you go get beat and think it's love. You know what I mean? Like, how the hell are we supposed to know the difference when we were never shown something healthy? 
Yeah. And now the first times we're being shown something healthy is someone who's not even our family who's showing us more compassion than our own family, mm -hmm. which is like sad if you think about that. But um, I went through a phase, and I'm wondering if you went through this after you left, a phase of seeing a healthy family and realizing how shitty my family was. Not my siblings. I, I want to give my siblings some credit because there was some deep, I really feel like there's unconditional love with some of my siblings because they snuck out to come see me. They didn't care what anyone said, like they were going to stay my siblings. But seeing my adopted family and how much they loved their kids <laughs> and how much they cared about their kids' well-being, um, I would cry myself to sleep every night because it made me realize my mom is shitty. <laughs> my dad's yeah. shitty. Um, did you go through that? <laughs> um, I think mostly... I was kind of in denial. Like I didn't think people actually liked each other. I thought they were just good at pretending. Really? Yeah. <laughs> They're faking it. You're yeah. all faking it. <laughs> well, it's just like that term of like, well, it's family. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. People say like, oh, we have issues, but they're they're my family. I always just felt like that was just like something people said because they felt like they would be judged for not loving their family. Um, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But then being in foster care, I had like deep conversations with my foster sister um, and she would explain to me like how she felt about her mom. And to me, I was like, oh, OK, so it is possible to like Actually, it was kind of just a realization of like, oh, OK, so people aren't just faking it. Mm -hmm. That's actually something that's out there that exists. And I just don't have that. Yeah, that's. Um my, so when my adopted family took me in, my dad said something to my mom like, oh, they're only taking her in because they want X. They know that in this life they haven't done a lot of good things, and so they're trying to get those brownie points to get into heaven. And that's how my dad's brain worked. That's how my brain worked a lot of the time, too, it's, especially with foster care. I'd be like, oh, they don't actually like me. They're just yep. doing this for the brownie points. <laughs> yep. There's always an ulterior motive that is for them, and they don't genuinely care about me as a person. Yep. I do think... I do think that was a very flawed way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, because the order looks at everything. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think that was always the case, but I definitely did feel that way a lot of the times. Well, yeah, because how could you not when you were raised with parents giving you the example of that, right? And I think for me, I could only learn genuine love when I was being showed it. And I, and I was shown it as an adult. Like, that's when I started really realizing so how was I supposed to have a healthy marriage when I still was trying to figure I said this a lot like a heart surgeon okay us we know what not to do what we don't want and I'm mm -hmm. sure when you got married you were like I know what I don't want I don't want my parents marriage I don't want all of this toxic stuff but you don't know what's healthy so you know what not to do but you don't know what to do so like a heart yeah, a heart surgeon oh the puppies here <laughs> we could take a break and say hi to him but I'm gonna finish this last thought a heart surgeon okay would you want someone operating on your heart that knows what not to do, <laughs> but not what to do? You're going to fuck it up. And so I feel like, and this is my biased opinion, people who leave the order and they didn't get time to do therapy and work on themselves and love themselves, you're going to, if you go straight into a relationship, it's going to be toxic. I, I, not only do I agree, but I kind of at this point have this opinion where your first relationship out of the order is, is going to be not the best mm -hmm. it could probably improve yeah um but i think you just need that experience and you need to l learn how to be healthy yep. and you need to i don't know i just i just from what i've seen and from what i've experienced that's how it is yeah um well, as well as something i should say that i believe is anybody coming from any cult but specifically the order needs therapy yeah every single person i don't think there's a single person maybe that's just my flawed interpretation no i agree because they people think and i've heard they're raised it. so differently yeah. that it's it's just not normal well it's also it is not um it, especially in the order it is not a habit to self-reflect and to look at your um so like for me i was a very people pleasing person which you were you were too because we were oh, raised yeah. to just people I please people please, am, people but not too much anymore but yeah. th through therapy you can learn those things about yourself and realize is this helping me or hurting me yeah. but your brain is not trained in the order to care about any of that it's trained to follow the one above you follow the one above you you're you're basically a drone everyone's the yeah. same right 
So I agree with you, like therapy is such a, people get so offended though. I had a, a yeah. sibling actually say, I'm not going to therapy, I'm not that crazy. I'm like, well at the end of the day, you are. <laughs> I mean, the way I see it, I'm, I don't know, I'm the type of person that thinks if you have a brain, you could probably benefit from therapy. Yeah, because anyone can. It's like everyone has a brain and you never know what kind of mental illness you could have. Stuff can be genetic, stuff can be there, but maybe not super bad. I don't know, the way I see it is everyone has a brain, so everyone should have at least some experience with a professional therapist. Mm -hmm. Just like everybody has a doctor because everybody has a body. Let's go back to the, where we were with her. So she was basically in front of your siblings saying, don't listen to her, she's possessed. Yeah. About how long did it take from her going from that point to, to kind of disowning you as her daughter? Um, I think, I think my mom, I don't know, my perspective might not be the truth. It's your But I do think my mom disowned me before I even left. Um, yeah. I think... I think she was just so disappointed in me with what happened in summertime. Was, oh, the, the sexual assault that happened? Yeah. This is very common in the order, and I want to brush on this. When a woman is sexually assaulted, I've, I've interviewed multiple women who have had a similar story of the woman gets blamed, the mm -hmm. woman kind of is, is labeled a slut or a whore, even though, again, I don't even know what I'm saying, woman, the child. Yeah, it is a the child. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The, the little girl is getting blamed and called a whore, called a slut, slut shamed, when the man, a lot of the times, is an adult who did this to the child. And for whatever reason, the woman becomes tainted. Mm -hmm. People start looking at her like she's, she's been touched, right? Well, like some diseased thing. The thing that stuck with me for a really long time, um, so when that first happened and Daniel first found out, um, he pulled me into my mom's room and told me, basically revealing that he knew about it. And then he straight up said that bad things only happen to people who deserve it. So he basically said that not only was I a slut, not only was I a whore, but I deserved what happened to me because God was punishing me for something. Oh my God, <laughs> that is so disgusting. And so that he wanted me to repent for that. He wanted me to repent for that. It, is this when, because we were talking on the drive over here when we went to go get Dutch Bros, <laughs> um, and he was making you repent every weekend and yeah. give something up. Do you want to uh, talk about that again? I've never heard this, by the way. He was, like, m making you give sacrifices. Yeah, so essentially, I didn't even understand it at the time, um, but ever since that first meeting where he said I was being punished by God um, and obviously physically hurt me, <laughs> And my mom was sitting there, you know, nodding Watching her head, wow. agreeing with him. Um, so I think that's when I felt like she disowned me. Yeah. Um, was around that time. Right. Um, but he essentially, I don't want to say every Friday from that point on, but it definitely felt like every Friday from that point on, he would just show up randomly and he'd be like, okay, time for time for you to repent and here's how, here's how you're going to pray to God and here's how you're going to ask for forgiveness and these are the steps of repenting blah 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 like mm -hmm. it was it felt like he was showing up giving me a Sunday school lesson about repenting yeah. and then he'd pray with me for what felt like a really long time <laughs> and then at some point one of these Fridays um, he was basically saying to me that I was possessed by demons, I was surrounded by evil spirits, and they were living in my stuff that I cared about. Your thing? My stuff. What? Because <laughs> it's, it's, this all kind of really like ties in together in a weird way with um, Rachel committing suicide. Mm -hmm. In those meetings, this, where they would basically trash talk Rachel, mm -hmm. um, he made us get rid of all of the pictures, anything, any memorabilia related to Rachel. He made us throw it away mm -hmm. or get rid of it because he was like, she was possessed by so many demons and so many evil spirits. And now that she's gone, they're all moving on to you guys 
to find their next target. And so he'd be like, these are these things that are tied to Rachel are tied to these evil spirits. And so they're basically portals for these evil spirits to come in. And He's so, telling all these little <laughs> teenagers this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Did you believe it? And you were like, oh, I yeah. better get rid of this stuff. I didn't. So that's the thing. Like, I, I assumed it was probably true because I, well, at you're that just point, a kid, yeah. I was just a kid, but at that point I did believe in ghosts. Mm -hmm. I still do. I believed in ghosts and I believed in spirits and all those things. Um, and I was just like, oh, okay. This is something that doesn't make sense though, because he's over here, he didn't want to give Rachel a tombstone. Oh, she's terrible for killing herself, she's going to hell. But then there's demons made her do it. So that's yeah. the weird disconnect. It's like, so did she or didn't she do it? And does she deserve to go to hell or not, you know? I don't know. It, it was always so confusing to me, and I just felt like I just didn't understand. Yeah. Um, also, because I feel like Daniel, well, all the, all the brothers, would always change the narrative to... Whatever fits. Yeah, whatever yeah. makes them benefit in the moment. Yeah, whatever goal they're looking for. Yeah. Um, but essentially, he would, he would then tie in the, the spirits and the portal thing with my stuff, because anime is bad, anime is evil, anime is the devil, and I was obsessed with anime. You're like, no! <laughs> <laughs> I loved anime so much, still do. Um, and so, so I had these anime, like, things. Mm -hmm. um, and so then Daniel would basically just be like, these are actually really evil, and the spirits that are tied to these are possessing you, so you're gonna have to sacrifice these items and if you can go without them for like two weeks or something like that if you can go without them and, and you start improving then you can have them back do you ever wonder because we talked about this in the car and she was saying i found out later he was selling my stuff on ebay do you ever feel like he was looking through uh, like what's valuable he's like these are actually really evil right here i'm yeah. just gonna take these yeah. <laughs> i do feel that way i think i think a lot of it was just like we don't want you to have this because we know it makes you happy um, so I think a lot of it was just punishment. Yeah. Um, but I do, I do believe that the very few items that I had that were of value were some of the things that they were like, yeah, you can't have that. Yeah. And then you find <laughs> out later he's been selling it on eBay. Yeah. Like, okay. I find out from someone at school who's related to me. Yeah, we have a box full of all the stuff you're describing. He ended up selling it or throwing it away. <laughs> you're like, like, what the dang. hell? The more I hear about Daniel, the more I truly believe he was, is it sadist where they like to see someone go through pain? Yeah. Yeah. It's I like that. he liked to mentally mess with his kids and to feel like he was like the he puppet needed, master. He needed a target all the time. Yeah. And I think it's because, I mean, you know him better, but t correct me if I'm wrong. He seems like a really, really deep, like um, malignant narcissist very very deeply insecure um but he, you can thrive in the order as an insecure man like daniel because everyone just bows down to you and puts mm -hmm. you keeps you on your pedestal but the second someone has him fall off his pedestal they're getting beat or they're getting put into their place i don't know there's like different mm -hmm. levels of narcissism and there, malignant is right underneath psychopath he could be a psychopath <laughs> did you ever hear the story of him taking the these kids to the middle of the forest and holding a gun to their head <gasps> Yeah, I think I did hear about that. But this is a true story, and I found out if I can find the news clipping, I'll show you guys. There's a news clipping because they called the police on him, and that's how we even know about this story. And the fact that um, that's the scariest part. We know about this one because it went public. What do we not know about that he's yeah. done? You know, I don't know. I I'm just used to him always being a scary figure in my life. Yeah, I think that there's <laughs> something that he, I don't know, like his frontal lobe got. <laughs> smashed in or something because he's just not he definitely doesn't have empathy yeah i mm, genuinely don't true. think he knows how to he doesn't know how to like love anything other than himself but i don't even think he loves himself i think he he's deeply um troubled within yeah, I himself know. i don't know i feel like if he loved himself he wouldn't be the way he is exactly <laughs> if anyone who loves themselves and loves their life they're not projecting all of this hate out there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, they're not beating their kids constantly. <laughs> if I'm happy with my life, why do I gotta beat the shit out of you? I'm happy over here, you know? Yeah. So I guess maybe in a way he's getting his own karma because his life, he's miserable. <laughs>
Nice. So, <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> nice. Someone said on my, um, they commented, they're like, how come your guys is, everybody in the order says Daniel weird? Do we, we say Daniel? Daniel? Daniel. It's just Daniel. I mean, I know that there's the <laughs> female version, Danielle. We should start calling him that. <laughs> <laughs> Daniela. <laughs> yeah, the baby's little laugh. We got sidetracked. <laughs> so, we went to the point of your mom kind of going to the to the phase of like disowning you. You described a memory that I have with my mom of so I did have I've, the difference is I had a little bit of more trust with my mom because she would keep things from my dad and I we would have a little bit of a bond where she'd be like, okay, just don't tell dad. Can't wait to that. Yeah. Continue. But but so I had that a little bit, but then I had a moment where same as you, my dad was beating me and my mom was egging it on. And mm -hmm. like, you did this to yourself, this is all your fault. And that's when like my perception of my mom's love for me changed. I was like, oh, okay, so dad will always be before me mm -hmm. and I will never come first. I, as your child, am beneath this man who is abusive <laughs> and toxic and literally has kids with his own sister and your sister. He will always come first over your children. Yeah, that's... Um, like even within therapy talking about those situations I don't remember exactly how they described it but they essentially were talking about how that's like a very very traumatic thing for a child to experience realizing that not only are they not safe with their father mm -hmm. but they're not safe with their mother either because yeah. their mother isn't going to do anything to prevent them from being hurt right um, they're enabling this to happen if anything there were times where I felt like you're helping this to happen yeah so even if even if my mom if <laughs> if my mom wasn't hitting me that much i could still loop her in as just as scary as daniel mm -hmm. because of how many times she allowed it to happen or would be in the background nodding her head in agreement with what was happening yeah so it's like you spend 90 percent of your life if not all of your life in the order in survival mode in um What's going to happen next? I don't know. Yes. You're constantly, and I was reading this. It's, it's a form of PTSD that we probably both have now. Mm -hmm. It's like PTSD of when life is finally like easy, your brain doesn't know how to process that. I'm always prepared for something bad to happen. Yep. Like I have this belief of like the universe balancing itself out. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> I always feel like if something really good happens, then I have to prepare for something bad to happen because it's karma. And if something really bad happens, I use that as a way to be like, well, I'll, I'll just have to survive through this and then yeah, something really good will happen. happen. I yeah. guess that's good for the bad scenarios, but then <laughs> it's almost like, for me, I, I felt like I can't even enjoy the good because I'm like, when's the bad happening? Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. It was toxic at a point, but I think now I'm at a point where it's, it's not an issue for me to feel that way feel like when you come out of the order, the cycle of depression isn't so bad out here because it was way worse than the order? Yeah, it's definitely way worse. So you order. think that this this is like happiness? But, so I'll, I'll just tell you my example of it. So I was married for seven years, and then when I finally, so when I left the order, huge weight lifted off me. I like felt physical, like lighter. Mm. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't ever have to go to church again. I don't ever have to listen to these incest men like telling me that I have to marry my cousin, whatever. And then I was married for seven years, but that relationship was kind of toxic. Get to, I'd file for divorce, and then, oh, big weight lifts again. And yeah. I didn't realize there was still a weight on me because that other weight of the order had lifted, but there was still, it was like leaving a cage, a small cage, and going into a little bit of a bigger cage. That's how it felt. Do you feel that way with yours? That's the analogy I always used with the order in foster care. <laughs> really? I would always say being in the order was being in was like being in a moldy, soggy box cage, and then being in foster care was be was like being in a golden encrusted cage. No mold, but <laughs> still a cage. <laughs> I can see outside, and it's lined with gold, but it's I'm still in a cage. Yeah. Um, wow. But another thing that like when you were saying that, to me it was like when I left the order, it felt like I could breathe again. Mm -hmm. Like I was holding my breath my entire life yeah. and it's like the more progress that I like the more progress I get the better I become the more I can breathe 
Yeah, um, that's such a good way of putting it because a lot of people want to run from therapy like it's it, like therapy is going to make so they can't breathe. But therapy and understanding yourself, learning yourself, loving yourself helps you to have an easier life in the long run. Like, yes, I do think the first sessions are hard because you cry a lot and you. Well, you it has to, to get worse things. before it can get better. And something that I learned was you can't you can't process your trauma that you've buried in the back of your mind until you've pulled it to the front of your mind. That's true. So you have to kind of dig yourself in a hole with all your trauma, mm -hmm. and then once it's all in the front, you can start working on it. That's so true. So it's, it's one of those things where I was doing a specific type of therapy, I don't remember what it was called, while I was in foster care, and I just wasn't in the place where I was able to handle that much trauma mm -hmm. at that time in my life so I had to stop going to that kind of therapy and then I went back to it later as an adult once I had a little bit more control of my life yeah and then I was able to process a lot of that that's a good point to make too like you have to be in the right state of mind to be able to really dissect the hard trauma because sometimes when at least for me too like when my life at home is still pretty messy <laughs> it's hard to then okay this is trauma right here but let's go process this other trauma over here it just makes your trauma even worse so to be in a healthy place mentally and physically to be able to prepare for the unpacking of the trauma i'm so glad that you're doing therapy and i'm glad that I've i had the opportunity i think that's a big reason as to why i advocate for therapy so much now mm -hmm. i hated therapy when i first left the order really i Did thought it was a waste care? of time i thought it was stupid i thought all it was doing was making me sad. It wasn't gonna change anything. Yeah. But I do believe that because I was doing it since I was 13. It just became like a habit. It became normal to me and I got through that, I guess that part where I was pushing things to the front and it was worse before it got better. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that I was able to do that now because now I feel like, I mean, I don't think super highly of myself but I do feel like there's some things, I, I look at other people that are adults in, in the n real normal world and I'm like, how are they behaving this way? Like, how are they like mm -hmm. this? And to me, I'm like, maybe it's because they need therapy. Like, yeah. I think everyone needs therapy. I think it's just one of those things where, I mean, it's not gonna be fun, but it's just like cleaning your house isn't fun. Yeah, but the But once it's clean, right. it's really nice. <laughs> That's awesome. I think it's so hard, and I advocate so much for therapy on my channel, but I feel like people that need it the most are the ones that will not there's, listen. <laughs> there's also the thing that you need to take into account. Um, there's different types of therapy, and if there's different therapists. There are some therapists that did not work well with me at all. Mm -hmm. And I will say out of probably eight therapists, I only really liked about three of them. Yeah. But the skills that they teach are still useful. It's right. just, if you, don't, if you don't think that the therapist you're, vibing, you're with is not vibing with you, get a new therapist. Right. It could also be maybe talk therapy is not for you. Like well, that's what I was trying to get to too. With men, they have a better experience with the neurofeedback than talk therapy. What I realized when I left was I thought I knew myself, but I really didn't. And I, I thought these things that I did were like personality traits, but it was really trauma responses. Yeah. We talked a lot about what it was like in, and then you went to foster care. Your family kind of cut you off at that point when you were adamant on being out of the order. Kind of. Mm -hmm. um, so for the first two years of being in foster care, my judge was like really pressuring me to go back. Mm -hmm. um, so I was still having like family visits. There was a point in time where I lived with my brother for a few months. That didn't work out. There um, was rumors that your judge was paid by the... I think she was paid. Okay. Maybe I started that rumor, but there's no way she's not. That's how I see it. Because how can you have sending you back, right? How can you have so many clients from the exact, I don't know if that's the right term, but so many people from the exact same situation, the exact same cult, mm -hmm. and you're still putting them back and saying family therapy will fix everything. No, the fuck it won't. Yeah. If it didn't fix it 17 years ago and it's not fixing it right now with the other person that you also have in yeah. your case files, 
why would it fix it for me? Right. But I, I believe know. she was paid off. But I mean, I didn't watch that's, her get paid yeah, off. Yeah, I don't know. I just, it's just, that's just how I feel. I was kind of put all over the place with mm -hmm. like rehab and like group homes and foster care. Um, but before I ever went into like an actual foster home, I was put into my brother's house. And then when that didn't work out, I was put into a foster home. And then I, things were improving with my mental state. And so I was still being pressured and I finally was like, I knew it wasn't gonna work out, mm -hmm. but I was like, I'm gonna try honestly and sincerely, I'm gonna try to make things work out with my mom, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's going to work out. Just to show my judge how stupid she's being <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> by saying family therapy will fix everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did live with my mom again for like five months and it got bad, it got bad yeah. again and they were gonna close the case but I got a new judge and I basically told her that I was self-harming and that I wasn't happy mm -hmm. and all these things. And so she was like, okay, well then let's not close the case and let's, you know. Put you in a better situation. Yeah, let's you know. find a better spot for you. So I lived with my uncle outside of the order. And that was like the first time they finally were like, okay, not pushing me to live with my mom again. Mm -hmm. They weren't like, pressuring me to go back. I'm wondering too, because you say that you were self-harming a lot. Did your mom ever notice?